Thank you, Your Honor. Judge, um, I filed this, these motions to quash on behalf of the uh, non-parties, Jeff DeSantis, Paula B. Bailey, Kevin Armstrong, Jeremy Murray, Jasmine Dillegard, and Dexter Bond. Um, and we filed these motions under OCGA 2413-23. And we're filing these motions and believe that these subpoenas should be quashed because these employees have not been properly served. They have no firsthand knowledge of relevant issues with regard to the open records matter before this honorable court. I'm going to put an asterisk next to Dexter. He's a little different, so I'm going to separate him out um, from the other employees. And, and the, I note that your motion is also procedurally differently cast regarding him. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. Um, and you talked about that a little bit with um, plaintiff's counsel with regard to Mr. Bond having knowledge and being the uh, business records custodian for the office. So his motion is out as a release from the original, what I call the original subpoena, the one that was received via email on August 2nd of this year. Um, and so his is a little different. Um, and the subpoenas are unreasonable and oppressive. Um, and as I just stated, on August 2nd of, of this year, the plaintiff emailed um, a number of subpoenas to members of our office. Those subpoenas were subpoenas for the production of evidence. They did not require witness testimony. Specifically, each email contained a business record certification, which we, um, each individual, Jeff DeSantis, Paul B. Bailey, Kevin Armstrong, Jeremy Murray, Jasmine Dillegard, and Dexter Bond completed those business record certifications along with the responsive documents um, and did provide that to counsel and to this honorable court. And we subsequently, on the 13th of September, last Friday, did receive via email to one or more of the individuals previously aforementioned um, another subpoena um, for the production of documents along with a witness subpoena. But I want to note for the record that that subpoena is different. It asks for different information than the one um, in which the original hearing started on September 5th of this year before this honorable court. What do you mean different information? Different information is contained therein. So the first uh, subpoena, the August 2nd, the subpoena dated August 2nd, 2024, asked for four items. All emails and text messages concerning critical mention, etc. Second, all emails and text messages including links with regard to um, attachments with critical mention. Number three, PowerPoint presentation identified as media relations executive team presentations for um, November 30th, 2021 PowerPoint. And then number four, and lastly, for this particular subpoena was an analytics graph. The emailed subpoena that was received by members of the office dated September 13th from the plaintiff's firm asked for seven things. It asked for um, critical mention emails and texts, checking account information through a Wells Fargo bank with an account number, confidentiality and non-disclosure agreements, number four is forfeiture documents, number five, uh, attorneys hired and dates of hiring, number six, promotional material, number seven, rebranding material. Different, we've already started this proceeding, we've already had some arguments with regard um, to the issues contained therein, and then we get an email saying that we're going to get, receive certified mail with yet another subpoena asking for different things. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that when I get to the overburdensome um, portion of this argument. Um, the, the emails, or excuse me, the subpoenas that we acknowledge receipt of because there was never consent or agreement or waiver that the emails from August 2nd were properly served. However, District Attorney Fonnie Willis, members of our office, we always try to ensure that individuals that reach out to our office have the things that they need. Transparency is a touchstone of who we are as prosecutors. We take a special oath to ensure that individuals that come before us or who contact our office are serviced well, that our constituents know that we are there for them, and that we are doing everything that we can to get them the information that they are looking for. So notwithstanding the fact that counsel has yet again failed to properly serve um, members of this office with a valid subpoena, we did turn over the documents that were asked for. Um, my, my motion does not go into whether or not there was proper service with the August 2nd subpoena. At this point, it's inconsequential. She has the information. The information, that the information has been provided. We have done that. We have complied at this juncture. We have satisfied 
the terms of the subpoena. Subpoena asks for documents, documents they have. And so at this point, there's nothing additional that is needed. And I will note for the record that during the September 5th hearing, there were two individuals that joined the Zoom, Ryan Holmes and Andrea Geiger with critical mention. And less than five minutes into that hearing, according to the timestamp on the, on the Zoom video, those individuals, for the record, not an official court record of the proceeding that occurred that day. Yes, ma'am. I understand that we can all use it as a reference point. Just to be clear, not an official court record. Absolutely. Those individuals were allowed to be excused as their business record certifications were sufficient. They did the exact same thing that we did. They provided business record certifications with the information that was provided, that was requested from, from the plaintiffs. They provided that and they were excused. Right, and, and in, in fairness, and I don't mean to imply that I agree with plaintiff, but I think plaintiff's position is they had no reason to question the complete compliance with the request that was made to critical mention. And again, I'm not saying it's fair or justified, but the plaintiffs have made a great deal um, of hay of the fact that they question the completeness of the representations from various witnesses um, that in fact documents have been, all responsive documents have been produced in response to the Open Records Act. And I recognize that. And and I say this in the least flippant way possible, but plaintiff's assertion that there is a belief that she is not receiving all of the information does not make that a fact. It does not make it true. It does I not agree make with it you, but the plaintiff has to some extent been able to point to independent documents received from other entities, like for example, critical mention, that would seem to indicate that additional documents should exist. Maybe they don't anymore. Maybe they're not in possession of somebody. There might be lots of reasons that uh, they weren't produced in response to the Open Records Act that aren't willful or in bad faith. Um, but I, I think in fairness, the plaintiff has pointed to third party documents that would seem to indicate that those documents did exist at some point. And I think in fairness that there has to be a look at the totality of the circumstances. The district attorney's office is not the IT custodian. We only have access to records for to a certain date. We do not keep, contain, or have a database that is big enough to keep every single email, every single correspondence, every single document that may have been received within the office. That is literally why we have an IT department. And so if we do not physically have it within our office, we literally, not even six months ago, had a cyber attack with this county. And so this assertion that there is a disbelief that we are, there's some nefarious intention or that we are hiding something, that we are intentionally trying not to give documents or information to the plaintiff or anyone else is quite frankly just not accurate. Our track 